within the act of forgiveness lies an extraordinary power. It is the power to right wrongs, heal wounds, and ultimately change the course of history. It is a call to show grace and mercy, not merely as a social recommendation or personal disposition, but as a mandate from the God who forgave us first. Out of love, he chose to take all of our personal garbage and sweep it away, erasing it from our past. In exchange, we have received a clean slate, a brilliant future filled with opportunities to pass this gift on to each other. Through the love of Christ, we too have the power to overlook offenses, right wrongs, and heal history. We too have the power to sweep it all into a big pile of garbage and watch it burn away. Because of the one who showed mercy on us first, we too have the power of forgiveness. We all carry around with us garbage. Sometimes we have garbage in our lives because of the choices that we've made, and perhaps there are other times we have garbage in our lives because of the choices others have made. All of it leads to this anger, this frustration, this bitterness, this unforgiveness in our lives. And it's garbage. But God didn't destine us for garbage. God destined us for freedom. And yet we all have it. And whether it's because a friend has broke our heart, a company has downsized our job, or a relative has stole our money, or worse, our innocence, we have garbage. You know, it's easy to say that we, you know, we just hide our garbage or that we throw it under the rug, but it's always there. It's always present in our lives. You can see my garbage. I've probably been wounded a time or two too many in my life, and I suspect if you think over the course of your life, you've been wounded as well. And so we carry these wounds along with us everywhere we go, every single day of our lives. You know, I picked up this garbage a long time ago. When I was just coming out of college, just finishing up, and I had my first job, I was excited about that first job. You probably remember your first job out of high school or college. Maybe you had excitement. Maybe you were scared. If you were like me, you couldn't wait for your first paycheck, right? I mean, you were excited to get that money. And so I had this first job, and it's no surprise. I was a Bible and religion major, and so I worked at a church. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job. I kind of created my own job description. I directed vacation Bible school. I led a group of junior high girls on retreat. I even had the opportunity to preach. All in all, I thought this, this job was going well, except... Then I had my first evaluation. You know, months into my experience in this job, I went into my boss's office and he had this piece of paper and on it there were all these marks of things that I was doing. And, and we went through the sheet of paper and he had given me, you know, good job or excellent job or above average on pretty much everything. But then he put the paper to the side and he told me how he really felt about the job I was doing. He said that he was disappointed in my job performance that I hadn't connected in the youth with the youth the way that he had hoped. And he also told me that I was the worst reader he had ever experienced in his life. And so you can imagine that I was absolutely crushed. I mean, I felt like I had a call into ministry, and I was crushed. And the moment I walked out of his office, bitterness, anger, resentment seeped deep within my heart. And I picked up my garbage. I picked up my garbage. Do you realize that this stuff, this unforgiveness, separates us from our relationship with others and our relationship with God? It's this stuff that keeps us from being the people that God is calling us to be. And yet, when we allow this to control our lives, when we carry our garbage everywhere we go, it's almost impossible for us to forgive. It's almost impossible for us to forgive. This morning, we're continuing in our sermon series, United We Stand. Last week, we talked about conflict and how we as a church are called to engage in healthy conflict. And this week, we're talking about forgiveness. Do you realize we talk about forgiveness all the time in the church? We say it when we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive what? 
Exactly. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted you were condemned. I mean, we sing about this. We, we pray about this, and we preach about it all the time, unlike conflict, which we never talk about in church, right? Forgiveness, we talk about this every single Sunday. And so why is it so hard for us to forgive? I mean, if we talk about this every single week of our lives, why is this subject so hard for us to actually put into practice? Well, this morning we're going to talk about the ugly truth that surrounds our garbage, that surrounds unforgiveness. So this morning I want to invite you to open up your Bibles and, or pull out your sermon notes and turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew's in the New Testament. It's the first gospel in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have Bibles in the gathering space. At the end of the service, take one, write your name in it. It's yours. Just bring it back with you every time you come to worship. And so here in Matthew 18, we discovered last week that Jesus is talking with the disciples about pride and humility and conflict. For those of you who were with us last week, maybe you can recall in your mind these, these four simple steps that Jesus gave the disciples and us when addressing conflict. The first one was to talk directly to the person that we have an issue with. Not to talk about the person, but to talk directly to the person. The second one was, if that doesn't work, take two or three healthy people with you. Now, healthy people are people who are spiritually or emotionally healthy. Number three, if that still doesn't work, take that issue to, to an appropriate church leader. And if that still doesn't work, then perhaps, just maybe, maybe that person might have to leave. Now, these steps toward dealing with conflict in the church are intense. But then Jesus goes on to say, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. So especially when we as the family of God are gathered, when we as the family of God have an argument, a dispute, an issue that comes up in our midst, Jesus is with us. You know, so often I think we think that Jesus is only with us when we're singing together, when we're, we're praying together, but Jesus is with us even when we're arguing with one another. He is in the middle of our mess, bringing peace and reconciliation and bringing us, uniting us together. Why? Because he loves us so much. Amen. He's in the middle of us, in the middle of us, even in our mess. But if you think about this, I mean, Jesus is talking about conflict. He's called the disciples to the carpet. And then we wonder, how do the disciples respond to what Jesus is saying? I mean, this stuff is not only intense for us. It's intense for the disciples as well. So let's take a look. Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And I want you to think about this. You know, I don't know if you've ever been arguing with God, but I do on occasion argue with God about things that he's doing in my life. And so I want to know the same kind of things that the disciples want to know. You know, God, if I'm going to let someone you know, do what they do, and if I'm going to engage them in conflict, if I'm going to let them hurt me, then I want to know how many times I'm going to have to forgive that person. I mean, seven times? And Jesus replies, not seven times, no, 77 times. If you look at the Greek in that word, it, it either means 77 times or 70 times seven. That's 490 times. Jesus is exaggerating here to prove a point. We should always forgive. But why? Because forgiveness is the key that unlocks the movement of God in our lives. Tom Rounds told me that, right? Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the movement of God in our lives. Without forgiveness, we can't possibly be the person, the daughter, the son who God has created us to be. But what does all that mean? Well, I think it's important for us to talk about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not codependence. You know, so often when we hear Jesus say things like, you should forgive 77 times or 70 times 7, we say, but wait a second. That person has crapped on me one too many times. 
I don't want to be a human doormat. I am tired of feeling the way I feel around that person. But you got to understand, Jesus is not calling you to be a human doormat. Forgiveness is as much about healthy relationships and good boundaries as it is about God freeing us from the resentment and anger in our hearts. You know, on a regular basis, I talk with my mom about those extended family members that are just plain toxic. Those extended family members that are full of drama. Now, I know you have some of those people in your family, amen? Oh, come on, you can get a bigger amen than that, right? We all have people in our families that are drama, that are toxic, that create wounds in our life. And I always say to my mom, you know, mom, I love them at a distance. And I do. I love them at a distance. Why? Because I know if I have appropriate boundaries with them, if I don't get caught up in their drama, if I just give myself some distance between me and them, suddenly I can have a whole healthy relationship with them. But if I get messed up all in their drama, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to get wounded. I'm going to feel bitter. I'm going to want to gossip. You know, all those things. But if I keep my distance, if I keep my boundary, if I have that healthy, appropriate relationship, I can have love. God is not calling us to be a human doormat. Amen? Amen? Yeah, God is calling us to love people. And that doesn't mean we have to be wounded by them. So forgiveness is not codependency. It's not codependent relationships. Well, what else is forgiveness not? Forgiveness is not saying that what the other person did is okay. You know, so often I believe that we don't want to forgive because we have this guilty feeling that if we forgive that person, we're saying what she did to me, what he did to me, what they did to my family, that was okay. But it wasn't okay. It's not okay. You know, over the course of the last several years, I've realized a thing or two about employer-employee relationships. I've recognized that probably my, my boss could have had a kind, different kind of conversation with me. That instead of blasting me in one 45-minute evaluation, he could have been telling me moment after moment his frustrations with me over the course of the months that I was working with him. I needed the constructive criticism. I needed what he was, that feedback, and yet, he decided to wait and give it, me, give it to me all at once. What he did wasn't okay. And so I know that there are people that have wounded you. There are people that have hurt you. There are people that have abused you. There are people that have cut you to the core. And forgiveness is not saying what they did was okay. So what is forgiveness? Well, forgiveness, forgiveness is having the ability to actually release that person or that situation from having dominion over our hearts so that we are free to be healthy individuals in Christ. Do you realize that forgiveness is freedom? When we have unforgiveness in our hearts, we're allowing that person to control us. We're giving that person dominion over our lives. One of my absolute favorite preachers and heroines of the faith is a lady by the name of Joyce Meyer. And Joyce Meyer, I mean, she is no nonsense. I love her style of preaching because of that. And she said about unforgiveness in our hearts that when we have unforgiveness in our lives, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I mean, hear that again. Dr having that bitterness in our heart, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. They're not dying. We are, right? I mean, we are the ones who are dying on the inside. And so forgiveness is more about us than it is about the other person. I mean, for some of you, you've never heard that in your life. Forgiveness is more about us than it is the other person. How do we know? What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we... Do you realize you say that all the time? 
Father, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. I mean, God can only forgive us when we forgive others. How is that possible? Well, think about it. After Jesus has talked about conflict and Peter asks the question, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Jesus tells this story. Now, I've taken some liberties to make it into a modern-day parable, so bear with me. There's this man, and he owes a company, the company he worked for, millions of dollars. Think Bernie Madoff in your minds, right? I mean, he owes the company millions. And so the bank comes after him, and not only do they want his car, his house, everything that he owns, they also want to force his family into slave labor until he can pay off the debt. I mean, it is bad for this guy. And so when this guy comes before the judge, he gets down on his hands and and his knees, and he begs the judge to just give him a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time, that's all I need to pay off this debt. Is he going to pay off millions of dollars in a little bit of time? No, but he's desperate, and he's begging not only for his life, but for the life of his family. And for whatever reason, the judge has compassion on the man. And the judge looks at the man, and he looks at his tears, and he sees him begging and pleading, and he looks at his compassion for his family, and the judge does the unthinkable. Not only does he forgive the man, but he forgives all of his debts, millions upon millions of dollars. He is set free. Now the man is strolling around in his newfound freedom. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees an, a shady old business associate of his. This business associate owes him a few hundred bucks, and I don't know what happens in the man, but he just snaps. He jumps over to the old business associate, and he grabs him around the neck, and he says, pay me my money now. And the man does the same thing that he did. He gets down on his hands and knees and he begs and he says, just give me a little bit of time and I'll pay off the debt. But instead of being like the judge, the man has absolutely no compassion and he throws him into prison. Now here's the problem. Someone's captured it all on their iPhone and it's been posted on YouTube and it's gone viral, right? And so everybody in the world knows this is happening, and the judge sees this, and he carts the guy back into court, and he stands before the judge, and the judge says, what are you doing? What are you doing? I, have so, I had so much compassion on you. I expunged your record millions of dollars. You wrecked families. You wrecked lives. You wrecked retirement plans. What are you doing? And the man says, you have no compassion. You have no mercy. You, don't, you can't even fathom forgiveness. And so the judge takes the man and he throws him into prison until his debt can be paid in full. And then Jesus says, this is, what, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So what does this have to do with us? Do you realize that you owe God millions of dollars? That with all of your debt and all of your sin and all of your pain and all the wounds that you've inflicted on others and all of your garbage, right? You owe God millions of dollars and he has paid it in full. And yet, and yet, you're going to hold bitterness and resentment toward the one who owes you a few hundred bucks. Do you see what God is doing here? God cannot release us from the unforgiveness in our hearts. If we have unforgiveness in our hearts, it's like we are binding God, we are tying God's hands, and God is unable to get that junk, to get that trash, to get that garbage out of our souls. You know, some of us aren't just mad at others. We're mad at God. We're also mad at ourselves. Some of us are sitting here today and we have so much unforgiveness toward ourselves. It's absolutely crazy. And we cannot have the kind of relationship with others and with God that he's destined for us to have because we have all of this junk, all of this stuff deep within our souls. You know, I carried this garbage around for a long time. You know, when we tell our kids sticks and stones may break our bones, but words 
will never hurt us, that is a lie, right? I mean, it is a total lie. Words hurt more than anything. Break my bones, I don't care, but words cut us to the core. And so the words that my boss gave me, well, I carried those around. They affected the way I worked. They affected the way I saw myself. They even affected my calling. I questioned whether or not I was ever called into the ministry because of what that boss said. And I carried that garbage, garbage with me. And then one day I was going through a stack of books and I found this book that my boss had let me borrow. Now I, I tell you, I, can, I swear to you that I gave it back. But there it was. I mean, there it was. Right there in this stack. I mean, this is four years later. And so I picked up the book, and the moment I opened the cover and saw his name, those feelings of resentment and hatred and unforgiveness began to well up inside of me. And the moment I started gritting my teeth, God whispered in my ear and said, Rachel, you need to forgive your boss. And I said, God, I'm over that. And God said, no, you're not. You're not over it. You need to forgive him. So I took a piece of paper and I wrote him a letter. You know, the kind of letter that we don't want to write? The kind of letter we want to write is, I hate you, you're awful, this is how you hurt me. No, not that kind of letter. I wrote the kind of letter that I was able to share with him everything God was doing in my life and the call that God had placed on my life. And I took that letter and I took the book and I put it in an envelope. And then I went out to my mailbox And I said, God, you know, God, I got to get over this. If I'm going to be the person that you're calling me to be, I got to get over stuff like this because people are going to wound me all the time. And so as I was placing that letter in the mailbox, it was like I was throwing away my garbage. And the moment I closed the lid, all of this peace and this healing And this love flooded into my soul. And I was changed. I was transformed. I was a different person just by mailing a stinking letter. Now, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's not a boss. Maybe it's a friend or a relative or a co-worker. But somebody is living rent-free inside of your head because you can't seem to forgive them. Well, God, God wants to do something in your life today. He wants to bring peace. He wants to bring love. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration in each and every one of us. And I think there might be a few of you wondering why those crumpled up papers were in your your bulletin this morning. I want you to pull those out. I left mine up there. And this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to write on there a name, a situation. Some of you might need to write a whole letter, right, on there. And I want you to give over to God your garbage. I want you to give over to God your unforgiveness. I want you to give over to God your bitterness and your resentment. I'm going to give you a couple minutes. There are pencils in the pew racks in front of you, or these are chairs, pew po- they are chair pockets. These are not pews, chair pockets in front of you. The ushers have some pins as well. If you need a pin, just raise your hand. And I want you to take some time and to write the names of people who need, you need to release over to God. So as Danny plays, we're going to write some of those names down. <laughs>
We say we're going to give it over to God, but that's a lie. (laughs) And we carry it around with us, but this morning I'm not going to let you do that. God's not going to let you do that. Because when we say, God, I want you to take the resentment and the bitterness and the anger and the frustration out of my life, he's serious. He takes it, and then he destroys it, and he burns it with the fire of his Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is ignited in your life, Well, there's nothing left. No room for the trash, no room for the garbage, no room for that drunk, that junk that clouds our souls. And so this morning, we're gonna catch the church on fire. (laughs) But hopefully with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And so all of our trash all of our garbage, all of our anger, all of our resentment, all of our bitterness, all of our sin is right here and it is burning. And God is freeing us. And he's saying, I paid the price with my son on the cross. I paid the price. You are forgiven. You are children of God, brothers and sisters claimed by the Most High. He has not destined you for garbage. He has destined you for new life. New life. And so this morning, God, we pray. We pray that we would allow the fires of your Holy Spirit to burn within us. That you would transform us. And that we would be made new. That we would be renewed that we would be restored and healed and filled with your love. God, there is none like you. And so, God, we surrender. We surrender ourselves to you. And, God, you turn our our ashes into beauty. And so, God, redeem us, restore us, revive us. 
We pray this and claim this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let us continue and sing our closing song.